Well, if you have a Bible, I would invite you to grab it and make your way to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 is where we're going to be camping out this morning. As you're turning there, I want to give you a lesson in Greek. Okay, I know it's early, but I think this will be helpful. There's two words in Greek that mean the same thing. There's two words in Greek for knowledge, uh, nosko and epinosko, or some might say gnosko and epigonosko. And gnosko is just a general knowledge, whereas epigonosko is an advanced knowledge or an intensive knowledge. And so you could say gnosko is to know something and epigonosko is to really know something. And so all Christians have a gnosko, have a general knowledge of salvation, right? You have to have a knowledge of salvation to be a Christian, to understand who God is and what he did for us through Christ and who we are because of what he did through Christ. But the goal for every Christian is epigonosko, that we would continue to increase in our understanding of God. And as we increase in our understanding, we would increase in our affection and in our devotion and in our submission and in our obedience to the Lord. Epigonosko, church, is what happens when we open up this book and when we dive deeply into the context and the meaning and the application of the text. It happens when we explore the inexhaustible depths of the truth of God's Word. Almost like a treasure hunter that's not content with what he has because he knows that there's more to be found. And so Epigonosko is important because without a deep-seated knowledge of the truth, we are prone to stray. We're prone to wander. We're prone to err. That's why Peter says in 2 Peter, and put that one up, 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, Make every effort to supplement your faith, for if these qualities of yours are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be ineffective. I don't want to be unfruitful. I want to be useful to the Lord. I want to be fruitful in what it is that He has for me in the days of my life. And so my prayer for us this morning is the same thing that Paul prayed for the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1. He said, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that... What? So that you may know Him better. I hope that's your desire this morning, that as we open up the Word of God, that, that you would have the same desire that Paul ha had when he said to the Philippians, everything else in my life, everything that I have, everything that I've acquired, everything that I've accomplished, I count it as rubbish compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus and being found in Him. So that's the goal this morning, that as we dive into this text, that we would receive some epic gnosko. And interestingly, the passage that we have before us this morning includes a whole lot of people who know Jesus, but who don't really know Jesus. And so let's read the, the text. If you would stand with me as we read from God's Word, we're going to do Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. This is how Mark records it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says, Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. May God add his blessing to the reading and the proclamation and the reception of his word. You can have a seat. Have any of you ever been to a high school reunion? Any of you have been to like a you know, 5, 10, 15 year, 20 year 
Anybody? Yep. Okay. There we go. And how was it? Here, so, uh, so I'll be honest. It's not like I thought I was going to be the oddball. I've never been to a high school reunion. Now, granted, I went to high school in the Chicagoland area. All right. So if I'm going to buy a ticket to fly somewhere, it's probably going to be to somewhere that I want to go with people that I want to be with. And nothing against my, like I enjoyed my high school experience, right? But isn't that what Facebook is for? Like I know what you're doing, right? Because you posted it on Facebook. Um, but what I've heard is that uh, high school reunions can be a little bit awkward. It seems like most people go to their high school reunion for one of two reasons. It's either to reinforce your reputation or it's to reestablish your reputation, right? Like to go convince people, hey, I'm still who you, you thought that I was or hey, I'm not, I'm not who you thought that I was. I'm different. I'm not that guy anymore. But homecomings can be awkward. And what we have here that we just read is Jesus's homecoming going back to his hometown of Nazareth. And I want to say so much that this is an awkward homecoming as much as a disappointing homecoming. And so where we left off last week was with a miracle to end all miracles. Like Jesus just did one of the most amazing things that you can imagine him doing. In fact, the past four weeks in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus ha has, has just been doing uh, greater and greater miracles. If you remember four weeks ago, we looked at uh, Jesus demonstrating that he has power over nature as he calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee, just with a word. Three weeks ago, he demonstrated that he has power over demons as he cast out the dozens or hundreds or thousands of demons, however many filled the demoniac. You remember that story? Two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus having power over disease as he healed a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. And then last year, we saw Jesus resurrect someone, right? Jairus' daughter was dead, and he raises her back to life. Like, that's incredible. Like, that should blow our minds. There was someone who was dead, and now she's not because of Jesus. Could there be anything more spectacular? This is like the height of his ministry, right? This is the pinnacle of his popularity. The disciples are probably like, man, our rabbi's awesome. This is crazy. Like, we never would have thought when he called us to follow him that we'd be seeing these things. Like, our rabbi's better than your rabbi. What is he going to do next? What could possibly be next? And then Jesus says, fellas, I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going back to Nazareth. And you guys are coming with. You guys are coming with me. And so you can imagine the excitement, right? They're like, oh man, it's on. We're going back to the... And so let me just give you a context, all right? Nazareth was a, was a no-name town, all right? It was, it was 20 to 25 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee of Capernaum, so it would have been a long journey to get there. Uh, there were somewhere, they estimate, between 200 and 500 people that called Nazareth their home. It was just a, a little village of about 60 acres. It was a small town. Everybody knew everybody. It was Jesus that put Nazareth on the map. He, in fact, you remember um, in John chapter 1 when Philip runs up to Nathaniel. He's like, Nathaniel, we found him. We found the Messiah, the one that, that's been promised, the one that's coming to rescue us, to deliver us. We found him. He's, he's Jesus of Nazareth. Hey, you remember what Nathaniel's response was? Is anything good it's like Nazareth. <laughs> what the heck? Has anything good ever come out of Nazareth? Right? This is the kind of town that we're talking about. And Jesus is going back home. And I just picture, and this is, maybe this is just me, because I, like, I picture like, like a movie trailer, right? Like Jesus, homecoming. Right? Who needs Spider-Man? Jesus, homecoming. And I picture, you know, like the trailer, and then there's one part of the trailer where you got like a line of 12 guys or 13 guys that are like walking, you know, kind of slow motion. And just walking with this moxie, like they're, like they're just tough, tough guys, right? Bad to the bone. They're, they have tenacity. They have a, a certain a ferociousness, a fierceness, a courage, a fearlessness, an excitement about what's next. Because they're walking with Jesus. What they don't know is that they're about to be exposed to a sort of rejection that they have not yet seen. Up until this point in Jesus' ministry, the crowds in, in every Galilean city have been full of amazement and awe and wonder and enthusiasm. Everybody wanted to see Jesus. Obviously, the religious leaders rejected Jesus, 
right? They didn't like Jesus. The Pharisees didn't like Jesus because they felt threatened by him. Like, who's this Jesus guy that everybody is running to and growing in popularity, and, and, and they're looking to him as some sort of religious authority instead of looking to us. But everybody else was excited. Or at the very least, they had a cautious curiosity about this Jesus guy. That is, until Jesus went back home to his little town of Nazareth. And it should be noted that this, this is actually the second time that Jesus comes home since he began his public ministry. Uh, Mark does not record the first time, but Luke does. It's in Luke chapter 4, it's shortly after his baptism in temptation. In fact, I want to show you. You can turn there if you'd like. It'll also be up on the screen. Let me show you what happened the first time. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes back to Nazareth. It says this, He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Of course, that's what he always did. He went to the Sabbath. And he stood up to read. All right, so this is interesting. Jesus was invited to read from the scroll that particular Saturday. Um, usually they would, you know, the, the, whoever was in charge of the synagogue, just like Jairus was one of the synagogue officials in Capernaum, whoever was one of the synagogue officials in Nazareth would find, okay, hey, would, would you like to come and do our, our, our scripture reading this Saturday? And then they'd have someone else to teach, right? So Jesus is given the scroll of Isaiah in verse 17. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And so, so let me just stop right here. I want to give you a spoiler alert. All right, Jesus is reading from Isaiah chapter 61, which is where it prophesies the coming Messiah. And Jesus is about to say, that's me. All right, so, so picture this. As Jesus is reading about the Messiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20, and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everybody in the synagogue was fixed on him. Now, this is interesting, right? He did what he was asked to do. He did what he was supposed to do. He read from the scroll, you know, rolled it back up, gave it to the guy, put it in the little box or whatever it is. And he sat down and everybody is looking at Jesus. It's just kind of awkward silence. Jesus is like, I, I did my part, right? I, I read. But he, there was even something about Jesus reading from the scriptures that people were like, my word, I've never heard it like this before. There's something about this guy. And so they're looking at Jesus. And so he's like, all right, let me give you a little bit more. Look at verse 21. And he began to say that to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. <clears throat> that, that prophecy by the Messiah, this guy, it's fulfilled. Here I am, right? The, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then look over how they respond in verse 28. It says, when they heard these things, everyone in the synagogue was filled with wrath all right, they were amazed, and now they're filled with wrath. And they rose up, and they drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. Like, this is crazy. This is like they grew up with Jesus, right? Here's Jesus. He just, you know, he talks about, he reads from Isaiah. He's like, that's me. They're so filled with anger that they want to kill him. And it says, but passing through their midst, he, he went away. All right, so he, he got out of there unharmed. He left, and now several months have passed. We don't know exactly how many months, perhaps upwards of a year, but Jesus decides it's time to go back for a second time. And it might be worth noting this is the final time that Jesus goes back to Nazareth. But this time he brings his posse, right? He's got his boys, he's got his entourage. Maybe, some would say, well, maybe just to give him a little bit more street cred. Right, like, oh, well, now Jesus is back, but he's actually got disciples? Like, people are actually following this guy? Maybe, maybe there's something legit about Jesus after all. No, that wasn't the point. Jesus didn't need his disciples to give him street cred. He brought them because this was going to be an important teaching moment for his disciples. And church, it's going to be for us as well as we unpack this passage. And so we see in verse 2 that he is invited to teach in the synagogue on the Sabbath. All right, apparently enough time has passed that they don't want to kill Jesus anymore. They invite him to preach. No doubt they've been hearing through the grapevine all the stuff that Jesus is doing around Galilee and up around the sea and in Capernaum. And so they're 
a little bit more curious, right? They, these reports seem to be a little bit more credible. So let's give him the pulpit again. Let's see what he has to say. And he begins to teach. And it says, the people are astonished. This is the exact same thing that it says, if you remember in Mark chapter 1, verse 21, or I'm sorry, verse 22, when he preached at the synagogue in Capernaum, it says, they were astonished at his teaching. And once again here, they're astonished, like, goodness gracious, this, this guy is not like the other rabbis. This guy is not like everyone else that comes here and just kind of regurgitates everybody else's, you know, message, just kind of recycles everybody else's material, or maybe presents some of their own random theories about the scripture. Jesus, this is different. Jesus is preaching with authority. Jesus is preaching with clarity like we've never heard before, like he's making the scriptures come alive and make sense in a way that we haven't understood before. He's applying it to my life like I haven't heard before. And as they're listening to Jesus teach, they begin to ask some questions and they begin to whisper to one another in verse two, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? And these are good questions, right? These are questions that they should be asking. They are legitimately intrigued as they are filled with awe and wonder and amazement listening to Jesus teach the word. But everything changes in verse 3. There's a shift that happens. The, the questions in verse 2 that started with where and what and how are now going to turn into negative questions in verse 3. Is not, are not. Somebody pipes up and says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? This is just Jesus. This is just little old Jesus all grown up. All right, well, like we used to change his diapers. We used to teach him in the synagogue. We used to, you know, coach kickball with him. This is just Jesus. There's nothing special about him. And the astonishment slowly turns into disregard, or maybe quickly turns into disregard, into disdain, and even to contempt. And I believe that this is a classic example of groupthink. You guys familiar with groupthink? It's defined this way. It's, it's a phenomenon in which a group of individuals reach a consensus without using any critical thinking or evaluation. It's pretty much when everyone just agrees to agree just for the sake of agreement because they don't want to be the one person left out of the crowd, right? We don't want to, you know, upset the apple cart. We don't want to rock the boat, so we'll just agree to agree. They're too close-minded, and they feel a pressure toward conformity and a pressure toward uniformity because they don't want to be the one to stand up and say, actually, maybe we should reconsider. Maybe, like, what about this? We haven't really thought about this. Groupthink. One of the, perhaps, best examples in our nation's history is the Bay of Pigs invasion when everyone knew that it was a bad idea, but nobody wanted to stand up and be like, no, I don't think we should do this. I'm just like, okay, all right, I guess, I guess let's go ahead with that. And that's what they're saying here. Yeah, I guess you're right. I guess this is just Jesus. I mean, who, who, who could he possibly, how could he possibly be any different? These people, these people had the evidence, right? Like the evidence is clear. It's overwhelming, it's unmistakable, it's undeniable, it's irrefutable. Like whatever synonym you want to use, indisputable, it's, it, the, the evidence is clear. And yet they were swayed by the ignorant clamoring of fools. And the same thing happens today. Right? No doubt you've been in a, a situation or a conversation where, where you're kind of in a position where I don't know if I should speak up or be quiet about this. This is kind of awkward, right? Like a comment is made about Jesus or about Christianity that kind of sets the temperature of the conversation. Uh, maybe a snide remark about Jesus or a sarcastic joke. And you're like, I don't agree with that, but I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to stand up and say anything. Right? I'll just, you know, just kind of snicker. Church, stand up. Stand up. Faith speaks. Faith stands up for what is true and what is right. Faith opposes what is wrong. Unbelief is what cowers in silence. 
stand up. Nobody here did. Everybody jumped on the bandwagon. And these were not just curious questions. Like you might read this and be like, well, aren't, they, aren't these just you know, honest questions? Is not this the carpenter? Isn't, isn't this the son of Mary? No, these were pointedly malicious questions. When they say, is not this the carpenter? They're saying, this is just the blue collar carpenter. Jesus is just a carpenter. He's never been anything more than a carpenter. He doesn't have any theological training. He, he's a fraud of a rabbi. He's an illegitimate rabbi. He doesn't have any religious education. He's just a carpenter. When they say, is not this the son of Mary? You would never call someone by their mother's name. You would never identify someone by their mother's name in the Jewish culture. It was always by the father's name. But they say, they don't say, is not this the son of Joseph? They say, is not this the son of Mary? Because they remember the scandal that followed that pregnancy 30 years ago. Right? When no one knew who the daddy was. And jo you know, Joseph's just trying to be a good dude and, and keep it on the down low. But everybody knew. Like, this, is not this the, the illegitimate bastard child of Mary? And are not his brothers and sisters here with us? And they don't believe in him. Like, they don't believe that he's anything special, and they know him a lot better than we do. And they were right. Siblings didn't believe in him. We, we see in John chapter 7, not even his brothers believed in him. We, we saw a few, a few weeks ago in Mark chapter 3, when his family came to see him up around Capernaum, and it says in Mark 3.21, he's out of his mind they don't believe that he's anyone special. And so the malicious questions began to breed doubt. And the doubt gave way to offense. That's what it says in verse 3. They took offense at him. They were offended by Jesus. Why? Well, we don't know exactly what Jesus said or what he was teaching from. It's not recorded here, but likely he was preaching the same message that he always preached. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's offensive. Repent. And, and, and listen, church, the gospel is offensive. That's what it says in Galatians. The gospel is offensive. In 1 Corinthians 3, we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block. It's foolishness. It's offensive. Why? Because to say that Christ died for sinners insinuates that you're a sinner. And that's offensive. You call me a sinner? Are you serious right now? Yeah, I am. And you have to understand that. Like, that, that's the bad news. And you have to get the bad news so that the good news makes sense. He could have preached out of Isaiah 8. He could have just, I don't know where, what scroll he was in, but in Isaiah 8, 14, it says this of the Messiah. He will become a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The gospel message is offensive, church. And we don't apologize for that. We don't back down from that. We don't water it down to make it more palatable. A lot of churches do. And what you have is an incomplete gospel. There was, a, there was a, a young church that started, and they got their own building. They were all excited, man. They were zealous about the Word of God. We're going to preach the whole counsel of God's Word, right? We're going to stand behind the truth of God's Word and declare it unapologetically. And on the outside of the building, they put that 1 Corinthians 1, we preach Christ crucified. And that was kind of their banner. This is what we're about. This is who we are. And as the years went on, Ivy began to grow up that building so that it covered the last word, and it just said, we preach Christ. And a few more years went on, and they covered the next word, and it just became, we preach. And that's what a lot of churches are today. That we don't want to preach Christ crucified, because that means that he died for sinners, and then we've got to talk about sin, and that makes people feel bad. We don't want them to feel bad. We want them to keep coming back and feel happy. We want to be positive, encouraging, so we'll just preach Christ. And we'll talk about how much He loves you, and how He just thinks you're wonderful, and how He wants to shower you with so many blessings, and how, and how He has such wonderful plans for your life to live the, your best life now. And then it becomes, well, Christ, like we don't want to, so we'll, just, we'll just preach. We'll just preach God. We don't want to assume who your God is. Like, we'll just, we'll just tell you about God, and, and you fill in the blanks of who your God is. Church, 
we are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed to believe the gospel of Jesus because it is the power of God unto salvation, and we are not ashamed to proclaim the gospel, the true, full, complete gospel message of Jesus that he came to save sinners. And so in verse 4, Jesus quotes a well-known proverb of the day. The, the proverb would have been, A wise man is not without honor except in his hometown. But he switched out wise man for the word prophet. He calls himself a prophet of God. And he says, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. The equivalent of that phrase that we would be more familiar with today is familiarity breeds contempt. Have you heard that? Familiarity breeds contempt. Psychologists have determined somehow, I'm not sure exactly how, that, that as a general rule, the more that we get to know someone, the less we like them. <laughs> All right, I'm not, not sure that's a, you know, probably not a blanket statement, but in general, there's something about like, you know, I've just, the more I've gotten to know you, I'm just not that excited about you anymore. You know, like, I, the more I hang out with you, there's things that annoy me. I'm just not that, like, I've become too familiar with you. And that's what Jesus is saying here, is you guys think that you know me, but you don't really know me. You've made up your mind as to who I am based on what you knew me to be, and now you have this little box in which you'll allow me to fit, and nothing more than that. You refuse to examine the evidence. You refuse to think deeply. You refuse to contemplate. You refuse to ponder. You refuse to reason. Therefore, you refuse to believe. There's no faith here. There's no faith here at all. And so look at verse 5. It says, He could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, if I laid my hands on a few sick people and they healed and they were healed, I'd be like, man, that was pretty miraculous, right? That, that was a mighty work. But it says he could do no mighty work there. He could do no mighty work there in his hometown. Why? Why could Jesus not do any miracles? Well, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, um, the woman who was hemorrhaging for 12 years snuck up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment and power went out from him. You remember that? She robbed him of his power. So now he doesn't have any power here. Come on, somebody somebody got to stop me. Come on. Somebody's got to stop me. No, of course not. Like Jesus is all powerful. Jesus is power, right? Power went out of Jesus, but Jesus was not out of power. He went on to, to raise a dead girl back to life. He could do no mighty works there because he would do no mighty works there. He decided that because of their unbelief, he wasn't going to do any miracles. I'm not doing it. It's not worth it. It doesn't make any sense. And so we, we need to do a little bit of work here and make sure we're understanding this rightly because this is one of the favorite passages of the Word of Faith movement who would say, you know, clearly they didn't get any miracles from Jesus because they didn't have any faith. Like that's what it says right here, right? Like if they would have had faith, then they would have seen some mighty works. And so it is with you that, that if you have enough faith, then you'll start seeing some miracles in your life. And if you're not receiving the healing, and if you're not, you know, receiving the financial breakthrough, and if you're not receiving, you know, whatever else, it's because you don't have enough faith. It's not God, it's you. You don't have enough faith. And that is one of the most damning heresies in all of Scripture. Church, it is not the amount of your faith, it's the object of your faith. Right. Even a mustard seed. Faith, and I don't want to go on a bunny trail here, but you guys, like a lot of people preach this, right? You're not getting what you want, you're not living your best life because you don't have enough faith, obviously. And then it's just like confusing, like, well, gosh, I thought I was doing you know, pretty good, trying to trust God. I don't, you know, I'm trying. And then people just leave. They walk away from the faith because they're like, I guess I'm not good enough for God. Like, I tried that, right? All because of horrific teaching on faith. Faith is not some sort of magic formula that you have to get right. That's more witchcraft than it is Christianity. And secondly, what's interesting and what we know to be true is that Jesus healed people all the time that didn't have any faith. 
let, let me read this. I, I wrote this out of a commentary. In Luke 17, only one of the ten lepers that were cured confessed faith in Jesus and was saved. The crippled man at the pool of, Beth of Bethesda in John 5 did not even know Jesus' identity when he was healed. The man born blind in John 9 did not speak of his faith in Jesus until after he was given sight. The demoniac whom Jesus just delivered a uh, chapter before also made no profession of faith before being liberated. When Jesus raised people from the dead, he obviously did so without first requiring faith of them. Moreover, the Lord healed multitudes of people even though not all of them believed. Clearly, Jesus' power was not at all diminished by unbelief. And so what's going on here? Why could Jesus do no mighty work? Why would Jesus do no mighty work? Well, we have to remember the purpose of miracles. What's the purpose of miracles? We, we've talked about this several times, right? What is the point of miracles, church? Miracles validate the... Come on. Miracles validate the message. The miracles authenticated the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, and it would lead the open-minded sinners into saving faith. But the Nazarenes here were not open-minded. They had already established their position of rejection and unbelief. And so Jesus is like, I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not a showman. I'm, I'm not here for your entertainment. I'm not here to entertain the masses with magic tricks. He had no interest in indulging their godless curiosity. He was a savior who came to set the captives free. But if a captive refuses to acknowledge that they are in captivity, then what's the why, like why throw pearls before the swine, so to speak, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. It says he marveled at their unbelief. Now, there's only two times in Scripture where it says that Jesus marveled. One was with the centurion in Luke chapter 7. He marveled at his faith. And here he's marveling at their lack of faith. They were astonished, and now Jesus is astonished at their lack of faith. This is a disappointing homecoming. So Jesus takes off. It's like, I'm out of here. It says, he went about among the villages teaching I'm going to go elsewhere. And this is going to prove to be a valuable lesson for the disciples as they're sent out, even as soon as the very next passage. If people reject the message, move along. And so too is it a valuable lesson for us as we go about living our lives under the authority of the Great Commission. If people reject the message, move along. Now, I want, I want to be careful in how I say this. Um, because absolutely we should be persistent, right? Absolutely we should be prayerful. And, and we do not know, like Jesus knew that they had made a final decision, right? This is like the blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We don't know exactly when that happens or how that happens. But church, your job is not to save anyone. Salvation is of the Lord's. Your job is what? <laughs> Scatter the seed. Shine the light. Put it on the lampstand. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. Your job is to trust that the Lord will bring about the increase. And so you pray, but I, I think it's okay to say don't waste your time with someone that's hard-hearted. There's a lot of work to be done, church. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. There's work to do. Move along. I believe there's also another valuable lesson in here for us, and that's this. Don't become too comfortable with your faith in Jesus. Don't become so familiar with Jesus that your faith becomes mundane. Normalization. Normalization is a real thing within Christianity, just as it is with any aspect of life. Um, I think about marriage. Those of you who are married... Right? Like, you may, maybe you don't feel the exact same way as you did, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Like, I just don't have that same excitement. I just don't feel the same way. You don't make me feel the same way I used to. And that's a common thing that people say that are struggling in their marriage, right? This isn't, the person that, this isn't the person that I married. Of course not. That was a long time ago. They changed. What's the advice that you give? Pursue them. Pursue them. Chase after them. Spend time with them. 
continue to invest, continue to listen, continue to learn, engage them. And so too is it with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. Learn from Jesus. Continue to engage in his word. Don't lose the awe and wonder of who Jesus is and what he has done. Don't become so familiar with Christianity that you, we read this kind of stuff and, and, and we're like, oh, yeah, of course. Like, this should blow our minds. We, we read through the pages of the Gospels and we're like, man alive. This is real. This, this is real. This is true. This really happened. Consider this man. And really, our, our faith should, should hinge on, on one thing in the gospel alone, and that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If nothing else, church, continue to be amazed by what he did for you on the cross at Calvary. I was thinking of that old Dos Equis. I think it was a Dos Equis guy. Stay thirsty, my friends. <laughs> Stay amazed, my friends. Stay amazed. Stay amazed. Don't lose the wonder of, of who Jesus is and what he's done. Like this world has a way of beating us down and causing us to just grow familiar with a lot of stuff. We oftentimes have cultural ADD where we just bounce from one thing to the next to the next. Like, oh, this is new or this is exciting or this is big or this is shiny. There is nothing in this world that compares to the magnificence of the cross at Calvary on which Jesus died for you. Amen. Be amazed. I spend a lot of time in my truck every week as I'm working and driving the streets of San Antonio and New Braunfels, and I listen to a lot of podcasts, and sometimes I'll listen to sermons of the passage that I'm about to preach. How did other people handle this text? What did other people have to say? Um, I have some of my go-to guys who are just like teachers, right? Like commentary, like, oh, this is good. Um, sometimes I'll listen to people I've never heard of uh, just to be like, you know, I don't know. I'd like to, you know, what does a little guy have to say? And I was listening to a passage or a sermon about this passage this week. And the, the main point that the preacher was making is who is Jesus to you? And he kind of said, this is kind of what we've seen all throughout Mark, right? Is, is people trying to answer the question, who is Jesus to me? Um, you know, when, when John the Baptist points people to Jesus, they have to answer the question, okay, well, who is Jesus to me? What do I believe him to be? Uh, the, the people in the synagogue, who, 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 what am I going to do? Who is this? Who is this to me? The, the Pharisees are going to have to answer the question, who, who is this man to me? The Nazarenes here, who is this man to me? And he just kept asking the question. He's like, you guys have to ask the same question and answer the same question. Who is Jesus to you? And like, I was getting mad listening to this. And I think I yelled out in my truck. I'm like, that's the wrong question. It doesn't matter who you think Jesus is to you. It matters who Jesus is. It doesn't matter what you think. It like this is some kind of postmodern relativistic garbage. Uh, of Je this is just this is my Jesus. This is who He is to me, and it's my truth. And you can have your own Jesus. The question that you should be asking, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, is why are you refusing to submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus? Who He is is clear. Mark says in Mark chapter 1, 1, this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he continues to prove it. The evidence is overwhelming. Jesus is God. And if you don't believe that, why? Why are you refusing to submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus? And this is usually what unbelief looks like. That people will say, well, I just, you know, I mean, I kind of believe... You know, this is, I believe most of this stuff, right? But like, I mean, coming back from the dead, come on, there's some stuff that I just, you know, but yeah, I get, you know, Jesus, good guy. I'm team Jesus. No, you're not. Not if you don't believe everything in this book. This is, we live in a world of unbelief. And listen, there are a lot of people in our churches across America today that have this same level of unbelief. And usually it works like, well, I just don't, like, I don't, there's not enough evidence to support, like, this, right? This, this is the one thing I'm having a hard time with. And then the evidence is supplied, and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, but, but what about this? Like, this is, just, I've never really, you know, clicked with this. And then evidence is supplied. Yeah, but this, I have a hard time with this. 
and they're never satisfied. There's always another excuse. There's always another reason. This is unbelief. And unbelief is a powerful force with devastating consequences. It always has been. We saw it back in the garden with Adam and Eve as they were tempted to disbelieve God. We saw it in the day of Noah as everybody disbelieved God. We saw it with the children of Israel wandering around the wilderness in disbelief. And even when, when they got into the promised land, right, just a cycle of, of unbelief, we see it in Nazareth and we see it today. But the message remains the same. That's the simplicity of this. The answer is the same. The message is still repent and believe. The message is still you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus, who came to this earth 2,000 years ago, was born of a virgin, lived a perfect, sinless life, and took that life as a sacrifice to the cross at Calvary, where He died in our stead in the place of all those who would trust, believe in Him. Repent and believe. This is the message for the unbeliever. If you're in here this morning and you've never submitted your life to Jesus, repent and believe. Today is the day of salvation. And this is the message for the believer. For those of you who are living for Jesus, who have submitted and surrendered your life to Jesus, repent and believe. Salvation is, is justification it happens in an instant. That's a one-time deal, all right? You cannot lose that. But the posture of the Christian is one of faith and repentance. Faith and repentance. This world's tough. Your faith will be tested. It will. There will be things in this life where you're like, I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Like, I haven't thought about that. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Your faith will be tested, but that's actually a good thing, church. Um, in, in verse 3, it says that one of the brothers of Jesus was a guy named James. James, after Jesus dies, is buried, resurrects, James places his faith in his brother, and he goes on to write a, a letter that becomes canonized in our Bible. And one of the very first things that James says in James chapter 1, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials, and you will, whenever you face trials of various kinds. Why? Because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. When your faith is tested, it produces steadfastness. And in that, the Lord is honored. And in that, you are strengthened. Church, believe Believe. Believe. This is what we are called to. The evidence is clear. Right? This is not some fairy tale belief. This is placing our faith, our hope, our trust in, in, in the one true and living God, Jesus Christ. Why don't we pray now? Father God, some of us in, in here this morning, maybe we would, we would say, we believe but help our unbelief. And I think, that's, I think that's an okay prayer to pray. Some of us are just beat up a little bit. We're confused a little bit. We've lost our bearings. God, we believe, but help us, strengthen us, strengthen our faith. God, would we continue to be amazed at who you are and what you've done? May we not grow cold. May we not grow familiar with the gospel of Jesus. Lord, would we continue to turn our eyes upon the Lord, look full in his wonderful face, and as we do, the things of this life would just grow strangely dim compared to your glory and your grace, the, the goodness of Jesus, the beauty of the gospel. God, amaze us, amaze us all over again. We thank you for your amazing love for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.